So thank you for uh, being here. Um, I thought I thought I would uh, continue on a little bit from where I was where I was talking about uh, uh, earlier in the week, but uh, do it from a slightly different. When you, get, when you get to my age, you sometimes look backwards and wonder how many good ideas did you ever have? Uh, and the answer is not many. And it then turns out that uh, they're not even your ideas, they're good ideas, they're somebody else's. And what is surprising sometimes is what I'm calling good ideas have a very considerable range in terms of what they can help you understand. And one of the good ideas came to me many years ago when I was working on housing questions in the city of Baltimore. And we did a lot of research on housing finance housing profitability, housing inequality, and the like. And we were writing reports and sitting with uh, bankers, uh, with landlords, with city officials. And um, the first report I wrote uh, really reflected the fact that I had just six months before started reading Marx's Capital. Now, I was not born a Marxist. Um, I only started to read Marxist Capital when I was 35 years old. And when I was 35 years old, I was uh, looking for something different and I started to read Marx. And the first thing that struck me was how totally incomprehensible it was. Uh, but there were a few simple ideas. And I wondered if these ideas really made sense. So I thought I'd try it out on the bankers and the landlords and all the rest of it without, of course, referencing Marx. So I put the whole question of housing, I shaped it around the distinction between use value and exchange value. And to my astonishment, when the bankers and the landlords and the city officials read the report, they thought this was the most brilliant thing that anybody had ever done. So I thought, my God, Marx must be right. <laughs> Confirmed by the bankers and the landlords. And one of the bankers said to me, oh, we thought you were an economist and you were going to give us all that supply and demand junk. This really works. And I thought, that was great. Well, two or three years later, in similar circumstances with a similar crowd, who by then had figured out what I must have been reading Marx, uh, we had a, a sort of a big citywide conference. And uh, a very eminent uh, banker from New York City, from the Chase Bank in New York City, who was in charge of real estate development for Chase, uh, was brought in to help us understand the housing question. And during the discussion, uh, I made the comment that very often when you approach a question like the housing question and housing inequality and the lack of affordable housing for low-income populations, that uh, you don't solve the problem, you simply move it around. Now, this idea of not solving problems, but just moving them around, uh, has actually stood with me for a very, very long time. It was a crucial idea uh, that uh, really lay behind my interpretation of the geography of the crisis uh, after 2007, 2008. Uh, but it certainly applied 
to the housing question. In Baltimore, there were many attempts to solve housing issues. Uh, but as often happens, one neighborhood, was, no, one neighborhood was cleaned up and made better, and another neighborhood went down. So this idea that the housing question gets moved around uh, was pretty critical to understanding the dynamics of the housing market. But the idea, of course, came from Engels in a little tract book published in 1872, in which it just clearly says the bourgeoisie only has one way to solve the housing problem. It moves it around. The slums in this part of the town are cleaned up, whereas the slums appear, reappear, <coughs> on the other side of the town. Um, now, I made this argument, and by then, the some of the city officials had decided I was a, a leftist of some kind. So I was being attacked by the city officials. And to my surprise, I found myself defended heavily by the vice president of the Chase Manhattan Bank, who kind of said, well, that's exactly the problem we've had in New York. We used all of the resources of the bank to take on one of these very low-income, distressed areas. And we poured money into that neighborhood. And we revitalized the housing. And we were very, very happy at what we'd done until we realized that the poor people were no longer living there. They'd gone somewhere else. And we couldn't find out where they'd gone. So he was defending me very much. And I made a couple of other comments. And suddenly, there was this alliance between me and the Chase Manhattan banks against all the local officials who were accusing me of kind of socialist tendencies and all the rest of it. I made the comment, for example, that well, you're not going to solve the housing problem without a radical redistribution of income in society. Again, I got attacked for that. That was socialist. And the guy from the Chase Manhattan Bank turned to all the local bankers and said, where do you think our profits come from if they don't come from redistribution? I mean, so this was great experience. So afterwards, he says to me, that's such a great idea, this moving around. He said, where did you get it from? I said, well, I got it from somebody called Engels. <laughs> and he said, well, is he at Harvard? <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, shall I let this pass and pretend that Fred lives alive in spirit up there in Cambridge, Massachusetts? Or would I actually just say, look, that was Karl Marx's power. So in the end, I told him it was Karl Marx's power, and he kind of went a little pale. And I said, oh, well, yes. Um, uh, that was the end of that story. But the point I'm trying to make here is that there are some very simple concepts that come out of a negotiation, if you like, between many of Marx's basic categories and actual events going on around you which gave me a great deal of confidence that reading Marx made sense. <laughs> and if the guy from the Chase Manhattan Bank could see that this made sense, if early on the bankers and the landlords could see that it made sense, then it was, in fact, doing what Marx always wanted to do, which is to hold up a mirror to the reality of the world and to try to show you what was actually going on. And this idea of moving it around applied in all sorts of other circumstances. We're having a serious, serious debate on environmental issues, conference on some environmental issues. And at some point or other, I said, you know, capitalism never solves its environmental issues. It just moves them around. It either sticks them in the air or takes them out of the air puts them into the water, or takes them out of the water and puts them on the land, it just moves them around. That's what it does. And everybody looked shocked and said, what an interesting thought. And you kind of go, thank you, Fred Engels, that's a great idea that you gave me. So 
That idea that the crisis tendencies of capitalism don't get solved, they simply get moved around, has been very important to me uh, over, over the years and become particularly important to me uh, in attempt, attempting to interpret what on earth has been going on in the global economy since 2007 and 2008. But if that idea is correct, then that would mean that the problems which emerged in 2000, 2008 were problems that had arisen because the crisis tendencies of capitalism had been moved to that particular place. And the particular place that it was moved to was, of course, the housing market and housing financial market. And it wasn't only the housing market anywhere. It was the housing market in a particular geographical location. That is, the American Southwest, very high concentration in Nevada, Arizona, Southern California, and a very high concentration in Florida, which I talked about last time. Then, of course, there were other concentrations of housing problems, particularly in Ireland and uh, in Spain, and of course of housing finance and so on, and Iceland and so on. So you have a particular location, and one of the questions you then ask yourself is, why did the crisis tendencies of capitalism, which are always there, the underlying contradictions of capitalism, if you want to call them that, which are always there, why did they suddenly converge on housing markets? Where did that come from? And it had a lot to do, of course, with the dynamics of what was going on in global capitalism from the 1970s onwards, and in particular, the way in which the 1970s crisis, major crisis of capitalism, was resolved to some degree uh, in the major capitalist centers of activity, particularly in, in Europe and, and North America. Now, I'm not going to go into that, but except, except to say this, that the housing problem arose in part because the difficulty from 2000 and onwards was what to do with your surplus capital. If you go to the International Monetary Fund reports, 2001, 2002, 2003, you'll find the following phrase again and again, that the world is awash in surplus liquidity, i.e. the surplus of cash sloshing around the world looking for somewhere to go. And it couldn't find anywhere to go. Production was stagnating. The new economy, you know, the dot-com economy had crashed. The stock market was not doing very well in 2001. You know, so where was it all to go? <clears throat> and it went into the housing market. But it went into the housing market in such a way that actually the supply and demand in the housing market was regulated by the flow of financial capital. Finance capital was flowing into the housing market to build houses. It was also flowing to consumers to buy housing with mortgages. So you have a, a closed circle, if you like, of finance going this way, producing, and finance going this way, consuming. And the financiers did not care too much about the credit worthiness of the consumers. So we get the subprime crisis, which later on emerged in 2007-2008. That subprime crisis also arose because of the politics of wage repression, which had been severely visited upon all parts of the capitalist world from 1980 onwards. By wage repression, I mean attacks upon the organized power of labor, I mean attacks upon the consumption power of labor, attacks upon the wage rate, and there are a number of ways in which those attacks occur. 
they occur by technological change, by labour saving technological changes, a whole raft of innovations in organisational form is cutting back upon the need for labour in many areas of production. There was, of course, offshoring. There was an attempt to mobilise migrants. And it's very interesting, in the early 1970s, if you were in France, the government in the 1970s was sponsoring migration from Algeria, Tunisia, because of shortages. The Germans were actually sponsoring Turkish migration. The British were actually calling for migration from the ex-Commonwealth, ex the ex-Empire. So during that period, there was also an attempt to mobilize migration. And if those three things didn't work, then you invented people with names like Thatcher and Reagan, who violently attacked all forms of union power, or, in Latin America, used military force to suppress the power of labor directly by active repression. Now, if wages remain stagnant, there's really then a big problem as to where the demand is going to come from to absorb the product which is ever increasing. And since the, much of that ever increasing product was located in housing, this meant that credit had to become much easier for working people to acquire. So the gap between effective demand of consumers and the uh, productive capacity that was continuing to grow was really covered by the growth of the debt economy. American household tripled their household debt in two decades, from about 1980 to just beyond 2000. A huge increase in household debt, fueled by a credit card economy, fueled by these easier loans which could be used for mortgaging. So again, you see the crisis converging on mortgage finance and housing finance in 2007, 2010. It was being moved around from elsewhere. The solution to the problems of the 1970s was actually becoming the nature of the problem that was going to generate the new crisis of 2007, 2008. Now, the interesting thing about housing is that a house is not mobile. It cannot move. So you can't take a house and ship it around the world. But what you can do is you can take title to the house, the ownership to the house, and turn it into a commodity that can be shipped around the world. Now this has been going on since the 19th century. So that housing finance which is located in a particular place also simultaneously becomes internationalized. And people often think about the peculiarity of global local relations. Well, when you look at housing finance, you see this actually articulated very directly. The housing market in Southern California is the housing market in Southern California. Where that debt goes on that housing, where that mortgage goes to, depends upon all sorts of international flows. And what the financial institutions did, of course, was to package all of that, of that mortgage money and start to sell it off around the world. Now, these packages were very peculiar. And I don't want to go into details because they're all, it's all very complicated. But in, in essence, it was this. You took together put mortgages, some of which were high risk and some of which were low risk, and you put them into a pool and said, these are no longer high-risk mortgages. Very strange things to, thing to do. You rate them very highly. And you then go to investors and say, look, we have this package of mortgage finance which you can invest in, and there are, they are as safe as houses. And everybody took it. At least, a lot of people took it. So the financial institutions built these huge pools of mortgage finance kept them for themselves to some degree, but also passed them on to other buyers. And then the question arose, who bought these packages of mortgage finance? And where did they buy them? There was in this an uneven geographical development. In some parts of the world, there was a great deal of purchasing of 
these mortgage finance packages. In some parts, there was none at all. And the reasons have to do simply with the way in which banks and, you know, municipal finance, uh, pension funds, and, and, and all the rest of it looked upon these particular packages. Some bought into them, some did not. When the housing market went bad, you had a double shift. First, the crisis moved from Southern California and Florida to the financial institutions, centrally, of course, the ones in London and in New York City. The financial institutions themselves then got into deep problems. So you moved sectorally from housing to banking. The financial institutions, after the, after the bankruptcy of Lehman, froze. Credit could not be had. Loose cash disappeared. And suddenly, there was a macro crisis in the global economy. Something had to be done in relationship to that macro crisis. And for the first six months of the crisis, there was a fairly coherent response on the part of the world's central bankers and also on the part of the G20. It was recognized, I think, by everybody in the G20 that the credit system had to be loosened up unfrozen, because frozen, it was going to absolutely stop the whole way in which the global economy worked. Now here's, I think, a very simple principle. The principle is this, that capital, in order to remain capital, has to remain in motion. It has to keep moving. It cannot, I think, ever remain stationary and static. So what this does, is then moves you to, to realize that stopping the system is a form of crisis. I remember this extremely well. I moved to New York City about three weeks before 9-11 occurred. And one of these astonishing things was everything stopped moving in New York City. Everything. The bridges were closed. The tunnels were shut. Nothing moved. Nobody was going shopping. Nobody was doing anything. And after three days, the mayor came on the television and pleaded with everybody and said, get out your credit card, start shopping. Go to Broadway. You can get seats on the best shows in Broadway right now. Because the economy had stopped and everybody saw that this was a disaster, it had to be got moving again. So keeping it all in motion is critical. When Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, the credit system froze and it had to be loosened up. And it was, of course, loosened up by injections of massive amounts of money into the banks and huge bailouts for any of the banks that were confronting difficulty, huge amounts of money being donated to banks that were not in difficulty, but gave them a lot of surplus capital. So, in effect, the banking side of things was taken care of fairly quickly, the banking system was stabilized, but unfortunately the banking system did not get back to lending very much, partly because uh, it had no confidence in where was it going to lend to. Industry was flat, consumption was down, housing market was out of the question, commercial property was in, was in danger, so the banks just sat on their capital. But then a double translation occurred because not only was there a sectoral shift, but it moved from housing to the banks. It was now moving from the banks to debt, sovereign debt, state debt. <coughs> now, this move was rather critical because it also had a geographical dimension. Some states were in a very good position in relation to this move. They had surpluses of capital. <coughs> they had massive foreign exchange reserves. And I think one of the interesting things you see geographically is all those countries that went through a huge crisis in 
right the way through to 2001. That is all of Southeast Asia and East, uh, much of East Asia and all of Latin America. All of those countries had experienced a vicious crisis at the end of the 1990s and into the 2000s. And all of them realized that the crisis had a lot to do that they did not have surplus exchange reserves to defend themselves against any speculative motion, any speculative move. So what they did after 2001 or 2002 is all of those countries built significant foreign exchange reserves, significant budget surpluses to guard against any speculative attack. <coughs> did those countries suffer from the crisis of 2007, 2008? Well, they experienced it, some, but most of them experienced it as a very shallow recession, came out of it very fast because they could defend themselves. They had the budget surpluses to defend themselves. They could not be attacked by the bondholders. Absolutely impossible to do it. They had been attacked violently by the bondholders in 1997-98, and after that they said, never again. We are never going to be in a position where we will be attacked. So that part of the world, which had experienced that attack then, was actually now much better positioned to deal with this downturn for that very, very simple reason. Other parts of the world didn't, were not so easy to defend. They had significant budget deficits. The United States had a huge budget deficit by 2007-2008. That budget deficit made it very difficult for the United States to go even deeper into debt if it wished to, to revive the economy. And there was also a political response. And this too, I think, gets you into a certain geographical differentiation between parts of the world where the political response was guided by a certain ideology and a certain power relation. Those countries that had very, very highly concentrated and centralized uh, concentrations of bourgeois power, particularly the United States and other and certain parts of Europe and so on, all of those countries took the view that there should be no increase in, in, in taxation, there should be no further development of, of deficit finance, there should be austerity. But that was a political decision, it was not an economic necessity. And it basically played, paid more attention to the interests of the top 1%, as we now like to refer to them, than it did to the whole mass of the people. The strategy that was unfolding was also driven ideologically by attachment to neoliberal doctrine. And the neoliberal doctrine had been very strongly articulated as a set of practices uh, back in the 1970s and 1980s. And those practices really rested upon two basic principles. The first basic principle was this, that in the event of a conflict between the well-being of financial institutions and the financial system and the well-being of the people, you choose the well-being of the financial institutions and the financial system. This is in effect what was done through structural adjustment in Mexico in 1982. Now, in 1982, Mexico was going bankrupt. If it had gone fully bankrupted, it would have bankrupted the New York investment banks. To save the New York investment banks, the US Treasury and the International Monetary Fund bailed out Mexico so they could pay off the New York bankers, but then demanded a reduction in living standards in, the, in Mexico of 25%. And they got it. That was the deal that was hit on Mexico. That was then the standard mechanism of all structural adjustment programs that the IMF developed from the 1980s onwards. And was, this is what happened to Indonesia in the midst of this crisis in 1997-98. These are the sorts of things that happened there. 
So this is, if you like, a, an ideological practice which continues to this day. In the United States, there's a certain division of interests. There's one wing of the bourgeoisie that does indeed want to have some sort of mild stimulus. There's the other that does not want any stimulus at all. The neoliberal doctrine is deeply embedded in the Republican Party, but there are many allies within the Democratic Party. And it basically says, we have to retire the debt. That is absolutely crucial for us. There is nothing else for it. And the only way we can do that is reduce social programs. And we have to also liberate capital from regulatory controls. So we liberate capital from environmental controls and we liberate capital uh, from uh, sort of uh, any controls over, over labor standards and, and, and regulatory forms of that sort as well. We even liberate, even the answer to the difficulties in the financial sector is even to liberate the financial sector even more than it has been in the past. So the uneven geographical response to the crisis has something to do with the objective conditions which existed in different parts of the world at different times. And it also has to do with the ideological predispositions and the power relations that exist within those countries that pit a very strong bourgeois interest uh, against the mass of the population. These, it seems to me, are the fundamental guiding forces that are leading, if you like, to a geographical variety in, what, in the ways in which the, the crisis has been uh, responded to. For example, one half of the world right now is growing quite well. It's the part that's based in China, it's the part, the part that's based in emerging economies, Brazil, Turkey, Argentina and the like, they're all growing very fast. If you're in those countries and you start to talk about the crisis, they look at you and say, what crisis? Though in Argentina they don't say that, they say, oh, the usual crisis, which is, you know, <laughs> the political crisis, which is going on all the time. So, this is a, so that part of the world, it doesn't know there is a crisis always. And in exactly the same way that in the United States, most people in the United States didn't know there was a crisis in Indonesia in 1997-98 in which 15 million people lost their jobs in about six months. Nobody knew that in the United States, so many people in Argentina don't know there's a crisis in much of Europe, don't know there's a crisis throughout much of the United States. So you end up with a very fragmented world, an uneven world, in which at the same time as there's this uneven growth, one part growing, one part stagnating, you're also beginning to see a flow of wealth from one part of the world to another. So there's uneven geographical development going on, and it's going on at all kinds of scales, micro scales, regional scales. In fact, a crisis is nearly always a period of radical reconfiguration, reconfiguration of the geographies of capital accumulation. And one of the interesting things to do is to try to track its particular kinds of manifestations and the particular kinds of solutions that are arrived at. For example, Iceland. Iceland, as an economy, was in a total disaster three years ago. It's now actually growing. It's actually recovered a lot of its credit rating. How, how did it do that after this incredible crash? Particularly since Iceland only has two sources of, of, of foreign exchange these days. Uh, one is tourism and the other is fashion. So how, how come Iceland could do it? Well, one of the things they did was to devalue. Now, Greece can't do that, of course, because of, you're in the euro, which is why I think you should get out of the euro as fast as you can. Because then you could do what Iceland's done. The other thing that Iceland has done that nowhere else has done is it's actually started to put bankers in jail. Which is why nobody likes what the Iceland model is about. And which is why, for example, the Wall Street folk 
are terrified that Occupy Wall Street might get, you know, some public support because they knew what they had done and they might follow the Icelandic bankers and all end up in jail. And they know that, by the way. So, but Iceland has come out of it, you know, fairly easily by a, a, a simple series of, of, of maneuvers in which it's gone back to basics in terms of what it produces and how it produces it and how it does it. It's actually written off a large amount of its, of its personal debt. It's written down the value of housing debt so that nobody in Iceland now has a, a housing debt that is more than 110% of the market value. So you just basically solve the housing problem and then, you know, just done these measures. It's, it's pretty, pretty astonishing how quickly they have come out of, of their debt. But of course, like I say, they, they have certain ways in which they can come out of it and others uh, which, 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 you can't, which can't, you can't lose. So this is, if you like, one of the lessons that starts to come out from looking at the geography that the crisis is being moved around, and it's being moved around rather rapidly. Uh, two years ago, we were looking at areas, uh, looking at the states like Latvia, Estonia, which essentially went bankrupt. Now they're not in the news anymore, they've recovered quite a bit. Uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, Dubai world went under, and you kind of go, oh my God, the crisis has moved there, and then all of a sudden you find Certain, certain municipalities uh, which invested in the toxic assets uh, put their pension funds are suddenly bankrupt and there's a spotty pattern of the number of municipal uh, budgets that have been completely wrecked by the fact that they invested in these uh, collateralized debt obligations and other places didn't. The Canadian banks have remained untouched by the crisis to a large degree because they didn't invest in any of those toxic assets. The French banks did invest in them, and so one of the first uh, banks to have very serious pro problems was a, was a French, French bank, where the toxic assets were a big part of, of, of its holdings. So the, the, the geography tells you where the crisis is flowing and how it flows, but it also starts to tell you, tell you some tales about how you might actually get out of the crisis. And you see those tales all over. I mean, of course, you look at countries which have effectively defaulted. Estonia, Latvia, and they've come out of it okay. Iceland has come out of it okay. Argentina has come out of it okay. You know, you hear all of these terror stories about how, you know, if you default, the end of the world will come. When you come to that world, actually it should have come when Argentina defaulted because that was a much bigger default than yours. And, and uh, you know, it didn't come to an end and two years later, surplus capital is flowing into Argentina like crazy. Uh, but, of course, Argentina is very well protected because its foreign exchange reserves are very strong. Its net external debt is only equivalent to 5% of its gross domestic product. It cannot be attacked by speculators. Furthermore, Cristina Kirchner has now semi-nationalized the central bank uh, and turned it into a, a political institution and is going to use it politically uh, in the event of any kind of speculative attack. So there are all sorts of possibilities that exist right now, even within the capitalistic logic, uh, to actually get out of the crisis, uh, or not, not maybe get out of it fully, but, but certainly to ameliorate some of the worst aspects of, of, of the crisis. And so we should be looking not only at the geographical spread, but at the geographical uh, configurations of responses to the crises to try to figure out what might work and how it might work in this place rather than in another place. Each place tends, of course, to be specific and different. The conditions that, that pertain in one place uh, are not the same. For instance, here in Greece, the main problem was, of course, the original state debt. In Spain, it was not original state debt. It was the housing market debt personal debt that was the nature of the problem, which then got transferred to the state as the state had to, you know, effectively bail out the, the banks who had financed the housing, housing boom and got, got caught in the bust. So the nature of the crisis differs from one place to another, and, and so do, if you like, the measures that, that need to be taken. But then in the midst of it, there is also this ideological predisposition to start to look a rather too 
closely to rather failed economic theories, uh, which, which are hegemonic in the way in which uh, it, is, it is said, you have to get out of the crisis, otherwise we will end up with a total disaster on our hands. I mean, here in Greece, for example, my own view is that the markets have already discounted that you're leaving the euro. I think it's pretty much a foregone conclusion. I don't think anybody in the markets will take it as a serious possibility that you're going to stay in. The only thing the markets are concerned about is whether there's an orderly exit. Now, orderly doesn't mean orderly for you because they don't care about you at all. What they care about is will there be a contagious effect upon Spain? Will there be one on Portugal? So what they want to see is Greece brimmed off, as it were, from those, and they want cast iron guarantees that contagion will not spread. Now, if you want your revenge, then you get out fast before those guarantees can be given, and then really they'll be <coughs> killed, you know. So this is, this is I think, uh, but why, one of the reasons why there's this tremendous pressure on you not to leave the euro, even though everybody knows you are. I mean, it's the politicians and the IMF, everybody say it'd be a disaster if you do. So uh, it's all kind of, but the markets are telling you, you've, you've already gone. And, and, and so, you know, my, my view is that every, you know, everybody should, should say, okay, let's get, out, let's get out, we're going anyway, so let's go. And, and let's do it in a way that causes maximum problems for the other side, uh, rather than sort of do it on their terms, which is quite, quite an orderly exit. In fact, I would suggest a disorderly exit from the Euro is one of the best things you can do politically right now. Uh, to actually stir up anti-capitalist fervor and anti-capitalist struggle. So let me leave you with that thought. Thanks very much.